Hi, everybody. Good to see everyone again. I see I got one wave. Thank you. That's very reassuring. So what a great segue from a very terrifying talk about invasive malignancy to on the kind of other side of how do we prevent these in the first place. And no question, photo protection regimens, which include sunscreen, physical clothing, avoiding peak hours, yada, yada, are so important. But one of our greatest tools that has been validated time and again comes under fire all the time by the lay media, by our patients, by even colleagues. And so instead of talking about the latest and greatest in, in sunscreens, which, spoil alert, there isn't any because we haven't had a new filter in 20 years, let's talk about the things your patients are going to come in asking you about with that pile of Dr. Google papers proving that sunscreens will be the end of days for mankind. So I think it's really important to be armed with information earlier on, so as soon as they start launching into one of the common misperceptions, you are ready to go to share the evidence in a digestible way. These are my disclosures. I do work with some companies that make sunscreens, but I actually do not work on any sunscreens. So this is our agenda. These are the things that commonly come in, and I guarantee you there are many more, but I think these are the ones that get the most hits on social media. This is what self-imposed skinfluencers talk about. And so once again, if you're armed with knowledge, you are ready for a fight that you will certainly win. Now let's think about what are the general kind of thoughts here in terms of photo protection versus UV exposure. It is a great debate. Listen, we know immediate exposure to UV radiation is immunosuppressive. Um, the inflammation that ensues can suppress your body's ability to fight certain infections. This is why patients who, go, who get, for example, uh, herpes labialis, when they go in the sun, that UV radiation messes with the longer Han cells, allowing the HSV virus to come out and uh, make a nice little blister or several blisters on, on the lips. Skin cancer is the big one. You were just hearing about it. No question, everyone agrees, World Health Organization, everybody, UV radiation causes skin cancer. There's no debate there. And then everything in between, in terms of accelerated skin aging, sun sensitive disorders, from polymorphous light eruption to lupus, lots of reasons to use sun protection. Well, what are the cons, and are they really even cons? You know, is taking this approach possibly you know, dangerous for patients, you know? Does it limit the uh, production of certain essential nutrients? Uh, is it affecting other systems? You know, the list goes on and on. So that's what we're gonna go through today. So question number one, how high do you have to go with an SPF? Because I think in the marketplace, it's very confusing. You know, now we're even seeing like SPF 43s. Why? What is with extra three? Like, it's really going to do a whole lot. Then there's SPF 100s, probably 150s and above. So the American Academy of Dermatology recommends an SPF 30 or higher. What does this really mean? When we say SPF, sun protection factor, what is this relating to? So this is relating to specifically UVB protection. B is for burning. That's why I tell my patients. This is the part of sunlight that will cause you to turn red a, th a thousand times more so than UVA. Now UVA is the silent killer because it doesn't really cause burning. It can a little bit, but it penetrates deeper in the skin. That is what really leads to accelerated skin aging and then even skin cancer. Um, but putting that aside, and that's really where broad spectrum kicks in, focusing on UVB, if you hit SPF 50, you are just under 99% coverage. So the thinking is, well, going higher, does that make a difference? And the answer is no, because you're never gonna be 100%. This is Disney film thinking because this is based on patients applying two milligrams per centimeter squared, which is a ton of sunscreen. No one is actually gonna do that. So there are several studies out there by several groups. This is from uh, Daryl Regal's group showing that that higher SPF is impactful, not because it's actually adding anything, it's because people are applying roughly a quarter to a half of what's actually needed. And there's a dilutional effect. And that's what I tell my patients when they ask about this. I say, you know, I would rather use something higher because at the end of the day, you're not going to use it correctly. This is not an insult. This is just reality. Um, and therefore, I want you to be in that safe window between 30 to 50. And this is further substantiated out from uh, Henry Ford's group uh, with Henry Lim um, and others, uh, showing that once again, higher might be better only because we mess up and we make mistakes. Okay, vitamin D, you need to get UVB for vitamin D. So take a step back from the actual biology of that. 
When our skin is exposed to UVB radiation, it will make pre-vitamin D. It's supposed to go on to be formed downstream. So the thinking is, if we block ultraviolet B radiation, our skin can't make that pre-vitamin D, and that's a problem. Because we know, listen, vitamin D deficiency is rampant. It affects bones. There's all this evidence emerging, though not a consensus, on its effect on immune health. To keep it timely, there's some evidence that low vitamin D levels uh, translates to worse COVID-19 outcomes. Flip side's not true. If you overload on vitamin D, it does really hold nothing for you. But vitamin D is a cofactor for mobilizing innate immune response. So yeah, vitamin D is really important. Um, do you need to expose yourself to a known carcinogen to get it? No. If someone put vitamin C in a cigarette, would you get it by smoking? No, you would drink some orange juice, you have some fruit. So you can get vitamin D from other sources. Where did this all come from? We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, on the other side of things here, vitamin D was shown in this small study that super high doses, please do not give anyone 200,000 international units of vitamin D in your practice. But maybe with enough evidence, we might be thinking about somewhere in that ballpark, it may actually help attenuate sunburns, but doesn't mean you need to get your vitamin D from that sun exposure. So this is where it all came from. So there are several studies, roughly almost you know, 20 years ago, showing that if you use an SPF 15 the right way, covering it, really using high concentrations, um, it would limit vitamin D production and affect vitamin D levels. I will say, for every study like this, there's a study showing that that's not true, that in real world circumstances, the reality is people don't use enough. They're getting some vitamin D exposure. And actually, you need very little time outside during peak hours to generate that pre-vitamin D. But at the end of the day, all that matters is that you can get it elsewhere. You don't need to put yourself in harm's way to get a, a necessary vitamin. Okay, oxybenzone. Man, everyone hates oxybenzone. It's really unfortunate. You know, it gets bullied all the time. So what is oxybenzone? It's actually a really good UV filter. UVA, UVB, it's cheap, it's easy to formulate. We know formulations are very difficult when it comes to sunscreens. You know, think about all your patients saying, I don't put that goop all over me, it's drippy, it stains, it's opaque. You know, I put it on my skin, it looks like kabuki makeup. This one's really easy to work with. Yes, it was photo allergen of the year in 2014, which means a small subset of patients, when they put it on exposed to the sun, they'll get an allergic contact dermatitis. This is a small fraction. That's probably the only real issue here. But what do we hear about? First off, it's an endocrine disruptor. I mean, ooh, that sounds so scary, so scared up here. Where, where does this come from? So it comes from cell lines mostly. So if you expose oxybenzone to certain cancer cell lines, it'll accelerate their growth. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be compared to a Petri dish. We are much more complex, we are 3D organisms. There's a lot more going on than a couple cells on a polystyrene dish. Okay, take it a step further. They fed oxybenzone to a bunch of rats and using this eutrophic assay, they measured the thickness of the uterine wall got thicker with oxybenzone ingestion. Show of hands, who's here eating their sunscreen? Yeah, exactly. Um, now, no question, the skin is a portal to the body. It's not like you put things on your skin and like, oh, it's just the skin, no big deal. No, we can see systemic absorption. So how much would you have to apply to get enough in your bloodstream to actually cause endocrine disruption. It's a ton, it's completely unrealistic. Actually, you, just, you heard from uh, Dr. Wang earlier, he wrote this beautiful paper with, the, uh, with mathematical modeling, figuring out how much you have to apply for how many years. It was like over 100 years of head to toe, multiple day applications to have that endocrine disruption. So let's put this to bed. There are multiple studies showing that this has no impact on fertility, reproductive hormones, you name it. But patients will bring this to your, to your clinic. Okay. I'm sure many of you saw this. Two back-to-back -back studies from the FDA showing that you could detect nanomolar, billionth of a mole concentrations of certain filters like oxybenzone in, the, in, in serum, okay? So it's in there, it's getting through. That's not so surprising. Now realize though, in these studies, people were applying that two mg uh, milligrams per centimeter squared multiple times a day. As I just said, no one's actually doing that in the real world. So what do we know? So people are bringing this. I mean, when this came out, there's so much media. Um, shocker that JAMA posted that first article on Melanoma Monday. Obviously very purposeful. So what do we know to be true and what do we know to be uncertain? Well, no question, sun protection is hugely important. Plenty of data supporting that. Um, yes, 
Sunscreens, if used in the right way, can absorb, get absorbed in the bloodstream at minuscule concentrations. You know, really the purpose of these papers was to show that they could do it. Not that this actually meant there's anything in bad. And that's the reality is they didn't show that. And in the second paper, they actually put a statement in the abstract that this is not correlative to disease. It just shows it's there. We don't know if it actually is problematic. And actually, we have you know, decades of data in terms of the safety of these sunscreen greens. Think about that, what I said before, not a single new filter in over 20 years. That's because the FDA is crazy about sunscreen safety. So the unintended consequences of this and many of these other misperceptions is that one, people don't use sunscreen, which who knows is effective. Two, we start seeing the, these ingredients being pulled from products and we already have so few filters, that's just gonna mean we have less options. Three, this may mean that sunscreen companies have to do more investigations, deeper dives that are more expensive, driving up the cost of sunscreens. So there could be some unintended consequences for these, you know, not even correlative studies. They didn't even suggest that disease was related to that minuscule amount. But of course, the media and colleagues of ours take that extra step. So we have to be careful with that. Environmental impact. This is a big one. So this is the data to date. In a lab, it was shown that between 30 to 50 parts per million of oxybenzone could bleach coral in a lab, not in the real world. Now, if you go to heavily vacation areas and you sample the water from there, it's fractions less, you know, logarithmic levels less in the actual water. Um, and this is in key areas. And we have nothing in vivo. There's been no real studies in vivo. It's all been lab-based. We also have to consider what else can do this. You know, there are plenty of studies showing ocean warming, acidification, changes in the environment are probably more to blame than an actual chemical ingredient. And obviously much more data in that arm than the arm saying it's oxybenzone. Yet I guess people don't follow science because it's being banned across the country and there's more coming, really more on fear of the impact on the environment rather than science actually proving that point. So, what do you tell this patient when you've, you're like, I remember that talk, you launch it, you talk about the data, and they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Here's some examples, okay? So the state of the science does not support that thinking, that the science does not support that there's enough in the water to actually cause a problem. But you know what? We need to study this more, we need to study this better. We need more in, in investigations. We need more data. And at the end of the day, if I can't convince you there are other options here. You know, there are other sunscreen ingredients you can use. So for example, mineral-based sunscreens, you know, zinc oxide, tame dioxide, they're inherently inert. If you really are that uncomfortable, these are other options. But the problem is we have industry partners, usually more lower tier industry partners, smaller companies, putting stuff on their sunscreen saying oxybenzone free. And it's that type of marketing that perpetuates these, these unscientific myths. What's the deal with sunscreens with nanoparticles? That was a terrible Seinfeld. I'm sorry, I apologize to everyone. I'm a New Yorker, I should do better. All right, so what happens with, so when we say nano, we mean a billionth of a meter. I mentioned that before, nanomolar. So we're talking about invisible particles of zinc and titanium. And every so often you get a study like this where they feed lab grade titanium, nano titanium dioxide particles to an animal and it causes a problem. And then the media puts this out. Once again, I don't think people are eating it, but hey, kids these days, who knows? So what's the con actual concern here? The concern is that if these nano sunscreens penetrate the stratum corneum, get into your kerosinocytes, exposed to light, they will generate oxidative stress. That makes no sense, right? These are photoprotectants. Well, actually, they're photocatalysts, but the amount of oxidative stress they make when exposed to the sun, when they're in the stratum corneum, is negligible. So if these get into our skin cells, that might be problematic. The reality is they don't. We have a ton of in vivo human data using the coolest technology, confocal Raman spectroscopy, showing that even in damaged skin, these commercially available nano sunscreens do not penetrate the outer layer. So much so that in Europe, they have, they have vocally stated that nano sunscreens, minus in a spray, because they don't know yet, that they are absolutely safe when used purposefully. So the way this is gonna be kind of highlighted in, in our world is ultra sheer, micro fine. Those are the terminologies that are used in the labeling for nano or shrunken down particles. So that's how you can identify these. And I think there's a lot of benefit to using these because you've, make it, you've turned something that is visibly opaque, bright white, invisible, 
because it's not scattering visible light, rather it's still scattering ultraviolet radiation. Okay, what about FFA, frontal fibrosing alopecia? There were a couple studies, usually very small, where they took patients with FFA, biopsied, did electron microscopy, and they found little particles of titanium dioxide. Repeat after me, correlation doesn't equal causation. You actually don't have to repeat after me, but it's more of a, you know, I'm trying to make the point, right? Correlation does not equal causation. Just because it's there doesn't mean it's actually doing anything. And so fortunately, several experts in the field, uh, once again, Dr. Wang, um, published this paper saying that just because it's there, we don't think it's actually doing anything. This one I don't hear that much about from patients, but it does come up every so often. Last but not least, benzene. So I'm sure many of you have seen in the media, maybe patients have come in saying, oh my God, I knew it. Sunscreens cause cancer. They have carcinogens. No, they do not. Benzene was never meant to be in there, okay? And this, this pharmacy based out of Boston called Valisher hired this external lab, and they looked at a whole bunch of different sunscreens, different formulations. Now realize these were from different lots. So when a company makes a sunscreen, they'll make a big batch, ship it out, and they'll make another. And each lot is you know, inherently different. They go through quality assurance. And so certain lots of certain products, they found, once again, very, 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 very small concentrations of benzene, but being a known carcinogen, even a little is considered a lot. And so 78 of 300 tested were, were identified. So what is benzene, okay? Where the, we, we, we don't really think about this, right? So benzene is used very frequently in industry. It is used to make other chemicals. It's actually spontaneously made by cars with exhaustion. It's, it's actually spontaneously coming off probably the paint in these walls, potentially. But it's so small, it doesn't really make a difference. The concern really arose from occupational exposure. So people in factories where they're using benzene to do a whole bunch of different things. And what's been shown is either inhaling or ingesting it, gotta ask why are they ingesting it, that over time, it interferes with our bone marrow. So initially, what you'll see is anemia, but ultimately, it's been shown to be linked to certain blood-borne cancers. So that's where the real concern comes in. Benzene is not a byproduct or a metabolic product or anything related to sunscreens. It was never supposed to be there. This was a manufacturing issue. Has absolutely nothing to do with sunscreen. In fact, the same lab found benzene in hand sanitizers roughly six months before all this. So it is a mistake, it shouldn't be there. And that's what you tell patients. This has nothing to do with the safety of sunscreens. And the good news is, it's published online. If patients want to avoid this, it's very easy to look at what's been published, okay? So that's part one. Part two is, subsequently, J&J &J took it upon themselves to do their own investigation. This was not FDA mandated, and they found several of their aerosol products, so we're talking about just sprays, not creams, lotions, and potions, several of their aerosol, not even all of them, they similarly found some benzene, and so they voluntarily pulled their products from the market. This is not the FDA engaging, saying you have to do this. They were preemptive, because at the end of the day, we're all here for the same reason, which is to help people. And so they did this in the, for the good of humankind, so to speak, rather than this was mandated. The FDA has not said anything about this yet. I'm sure we'll see some guidance, but for now, if someone is really concerned, just stay away from sprays. And sprays are harder to use anyway in terms of figuring out how much you're actually getting on. So stick with what we know. Stick with lotions, creams, and whatever. And yes, we should all be urging to keep using sunscreen. Yes, that DC doctor is me, uh, but I think it's on us to get this out there in any way we can, okay? So to sum up, there's a lot of controversy out there, all right? We need to be aware of it. We need to have our finger on the pulse of it because every day something else comes out. Some, you know, TikTok star posts something that's completely non-evidence-based and it goes viral, and next thing we know, our patients are calling us up frantic that we recommended something that is going to kill them, pretty much. And so, always follow the science and the evidence, and if you look at any one of these, which there are certainly a lot of, this is a short list, we fortunately have good science supporting evidence-based recommendations. So be mindful of these, stay in touch with these, as these are obviously kind of evolving stories, but the good news is they always seem to evolve in the right direction. So make sure to keep an eye on the, you know, on the news for, for more of this. Thank you so much. So I think I have a couple, I can take time for a couple questions. Any questions? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry.
So if, right, so if you're relying on sun exposure for you know, pre-vitamin D formation in the skin, UVB uh, um, associated pre-vitamin D formation, where you are absolutely plays a role. So the closer you are to the equator, time of day, elevation, um, even pollution, truthfully, a lot of things do play a role in it. So it's, yes, and that's I think part of the issue here is when you do see these studies, you would have to really get a very large N to make any heads or tail of it. So you're right, where you are will play a very big role of how easily you can generate uh, vitamin D, absolutely. I can't answer that. <laughs> Is this thing on? I'm sorry? Ooh, great question. Um, and foreshadow, I'm actually doing a study on this right now because um, that's a really hard sell. So um, I think, and this brings up a bigger discussion, is what do we recommend for scalp for any topical therapy, right? Uh, because it's not even just about dealing with a hair-bearing area, but depending on demographic, the quality of the hair varies, and the vehicle you choose can actually cause more harm than good. So when it comes to the scalp, predominantly number one is wear a hat. That's, my That's the first thing I'll say is wear a hat. Nothing better than literally physical protection from UV radiation. If it has to be sunscreen, prior to the whole benzene thing, I actually did recommend sprays, and what I'd recommend doing is spray into your hand, because it's a liquid, and then take that and try to massage into your scalp. No question, it makes the hair sticky and matted, but you're right, we don't really have great sunscreens for the scalp. Um, there is a sunscreen gel by a company, I'm not gonna say the name of the company, but it is a company that is owned by a famous actress, so I'll let you figure that out on your own. Um, while I don't like her and what she says about sunscreens in general, they have a gel that actually rubs into hair bearing areas very, very easily. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of sunscreen gels. Um, but yeah, it's tough, because even like when you think about RX products, you know, foams, oils, solutions, depending on the hair, I mean, I'll be honest, I sometimes use ointments in the scalp when someone has very dry, brittle hair, and it actually helps the quality of the hair and prevents hair breakage. So it, it is a challenge, and I think we are really missing the boat and having, we really need to think about having sunscreens that are really designed and studied for the scalp. So your, your thinking is absolutely perfect. We don't have great options. So I would say gels or solutions or sprays, but usually spray it into the hand and then kind of massage in the scalp. But a hat's obviously gonna be best, better than anything. Good question. So Heliocare Polypotum Leucotomus is a, from the fern extract, it's found in South America. A um, lot of really interesting evidence from bench to literally bedside. Um, so a couple, let's start just with the trade name. So Heliocare is one version of many polypodium products on the market. And all the data we have is specific to that. And I will say a lot of companies try to jump on their data and say, oh yeah, us too. And that's not okay. So that's one. Number two, I think is a great sunscreen adjuvant. And I'm looking, I'm assuming the question's from here. I'm sorry if it's somewhere else, sound travels, but. So um, the data shows that it serves a really antioxidant and it's almost analogous to maybe an SPF three to six, which is not really a fair comparison. Um, it is not to replace sunscreen. It's to be used in conjunction with it. And there are a couple nice clinical studies, one in the JAD, where they took patients, they did minimal erythermal dosing, seeing how much energy was needed to turn them pink or red. And then the next day, they gave them Helocare. They then did it again, and it showed that you needed an, an additional, a next step up of MED to cause a burn. So my recommendation is, and this is actually for myself, I'll take, if I know I'm gonna be outside for a long time, in addition to everything I would normally do. So I think for people who are um, you know, prone to burning or have photosensitive dermatosis, so there are a couple studies in polymorphous light eruption, connective tissue diseases, high risk dysplastic nevi patients, showing that using heliocare in addition to everything else actually confers better outcomes. So I, I, I do drink the Kool-Aid, I think it's a good product, but don't be fooled, it is not an oral sunscreen. It has to be used in conjunction with everything else. Any other questions? You know, I was actually hoping someone would bring that up. Um, repeat, that. repeat that. Oh, so the question was, do I constantly, rec or do I frequently recognize niacinamide? And that's niacinamide, 500 milligrams twice a day, 
based on the New England Journal of Medicine study. That was a really nice study. And what that study looked at was high-risk skin cancer patients. So patients had three or more non-melanoma, and I forget the criteria for the melanoma patients, and they showed an overall reduced incidence of new skin cancers in those who took it ongoing. So it seems like a simple recommendation, right? It's a B vitamin, you know, it's safe, it's easy, but the thing is you have to stay on it forever. And so there's a cost to that. So I only recommend it to patients for whom fit the picture from the study. So I will recommend it to someone who's had three or more skin cancers, um, and I tell them, you gotta keep up with this. Like, it's not worth going on it if you're gonna stop this even a year from now, or two years from now, because any benefit gained will then be lost. So for the right patient, I do recommend it. Helio Care actually has that in one of their products now, right? The nice, um, they added I that think in you're there. right, yeah. I think the, that is the true. The advanced one, yes. I don't know what the dosing is, but I, I think that's right. There is like a Helio Care Advanced or, Pro or iPhone 10, I don't know. 